sweet decadence of 101 favorite recipes. He also has a blog you can check out with great, great recipes on it. The last time he told a story, he actually baked us a cake. Oh, I hope he baked us something tonight. <laughs> hey, I'd like to welcome Buck Bannister to the stage. I, I hate to disappoint Penelope and Adam, but I didn't get around to making anything today. Uh, good evening. Uh, start by telling you that July 26, 2006 was the longest day and night of my life because that's the day that I found out I was dying. About eight months before that, I started having weird symptoms. My uh, my legs began to swell up. I had had a back injury just a few weeks before all that happened. And of course I thought, oh, well, it's got something to do with that. Even though in the back of my mind, because I used to be an orthopedic nurse, I knew better. But um, I went along with it, said, surely it's got something to do with that. By Christmas, uh, my left leg was about twice the size it should have been and I was having trouble walking around. By January, I was having trouble breathing. One night I went to bed and it felt kind of this weird little pop and uh, realized that no longer could I sleep on my left side. I would become short of breath. Walking through the house, I would get short of breath. It got worse and worse. I went to uh, a local doctor who would take payments because I had lost my job by that point because I was sick all the time. And uh, she, she kept treating me for contact dermatitis. Uh, at one point she was treating me for lupus. And I was taking a lot of steroids. And things would get a little bit better when I would take the steroids. But as soon as I came off, everything would start again. But finally, uh, around May of that year, she uh, told me, well, I really don't know what's wrong with you. And there's not anything else I can do for you. And you can't afford to pay for a specialist. And you can't afford to pay for bigger, more expensive tests. So I didn't know what to do. And she sent me home. And I went home for two months and sat around the house thinking either it's going to get better or it's going to get worse. And it got worse. Finally, in late July, it had gotten bad enough that my partner, Michael, was very upset. And I had gone back and forth to our local ER a few times, and they treated me for contact dermatitis. In fact, I got to the point where I carried a note that said, this is not contact dermatitis. <laughs> but uh, in late July, it was, it was bad enough that um, he said, OK, you've got to do something. You know, you're, you're sitting here getting worse and worse got to do something. So I sent an email to my sister, who lived in a slightly larger town nearby, and tried to explain to her what was happening. I read that email later, and uh, there wasn't a single word spelled correctly in that email. In fact, it was incomprehensible. I thought I was writing a very <coughs> perfect little note, and uh, she came over that afternoon and uh, picked me up, took me over to the hospital near where she lived, which was bigger, went into the ER. Their doctor took one look at me and said, um, I have to do a few tests, but you have end-stage liver disease. And I freaked a little bit at that point. My mother uh, had died about three years earlier of liver disease. That night, they took me upstairs to try to stabilize me and figure out what we are going to do. And they put me in a room on the same floor where my mother had died, three doors down from the room where she died of liver disease. And I sit in that room that night, not knowing what was going to happen. After a few days of doing tests and things, they uh, told me, well, your only chance is a liver transplant. I had no insurance had no idea how I was going to go about getting a liver transplant. Eventually, we had to um, 
to get me classified as disabled uh, because I was dying, which for some reason the people at Social Security didn't find disabling that you're dying. <laughs> uh, and it actually took a phone call from, of all people, Lindsey Graham, Republican Senator of South Carolina, uh, to get me approved for disability so that I could get a liver transplant. The um, weird thing about that, that little time period when they were trying to stabilize me, though, was I lost a week, an entire week. There's a thing with uh, liver disease called hepatic encephalopathy, and that's a big fancy word for there's a lot of chemicals that your body can't handle, and they build up, and they cause you to go a little bit weird. And uh, I did. I lost an entire week. At one point, I, um, I actually found myself singing hymns with a Baptist church group from my sister's church. It's really strange because I'm actually an agnostic. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, later on that, that fall, uh, they sent me to the Medical University of South Carolina to be evaluated for transplant. And uh, during that process, which is a, a long and drawn out process, uh, they tested me for everything under the sun. Eventually I was okayed for a transplant and I was told it would be probably a month, two months, uh, maybe, before a liver would become available. Three days later they called me and they said we have a match to come to Charleston. And they transplanted me about three o'clock in the morning on a Saturday morning, Saturday night, Sunday morning. And uh, a week later I was out of ICU, doing fine. Uh, five days after that, I was out of the hospital completely in shopping. This is after not being able to walk for months because of all the, the uh, ascites, which is build up of fluid and the lungs and everything else. That's the story I usually tell folks when I'm doing a Donate Life program. Since this isn't a Donate Life program, I'll tell you some other things. There's a lot of guilt when you have a transplant. I had what's called a deceased, deceased donor transplant, which means that the person who, whose liver now resides in me died. That's, that's a pretty sobering thought. It's even more sobering when after you have your transplant and most of the people you know are very religious and they come up to you and they say, oh, you're blessed. God must have a purpose for you. You're so blessed. We prayed so hard for you to have a transplant. Yeah, well, what about the person who died so I could have the transplant? Were they less deserving to live? It's a very, very sobering thing. And there's a lot of guilt. In fact, enough guilt that I actually went to see a therapist for a while. Because you, you go through these periods of great euphoria where you're happy to be alive. And then the next minute, you're sure that you'll never live up to things. Um, it was part of that process that, that really brought me around to, to thinking about life in a different way. Um, I, I, I realized that my agnosticism had, had gone a little farther along and uh, I was now truly an atheist. Um, it's a strange thing because most uh, most transplant people you'll find uh, will profess to be very religious uh, and consider it a religious experience. Unfortunately for me, the rigid logic of it took me in a different direction. The fact that someone died so I had to so I could live, and people were telling me, "Oh, well, we were praying for you to get the transplant." It just wouldn't sit with me logically. It's a, it's a very, very challenging thing to have a transplant. It's something you won't hear when you go to something for Donate Life or one of these things and, and you hear us talk. We'll, we'll tell you all about how great it is and how wonderful it feels. But there's a lot of other things that go along with it. It's great to be alive and I'm glad I'm alive every day. I'm glad I can spend time with my partner Michael there. I can enjoy his music, and I can do things like this, and meet new people, and cook, and bake. It's all great. But I can never forget 
but there's a young man in South Carolina whose family were kind enough that in the midst of their tragedy, they decided they were going to let some other people live. So, thank you.